Afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Before we get started today, I just want to um, let you know there's been one uh, brief addition to the President's schedule. Uh, this afternoon, he'll be convening a conference call with the members of the USAID DART team who are currently deployed to West Africa, responding to the Ebola outbreak in that region of the world. Uh, these are individuals who've been on the ground in West Africa since, I believe, uh, the first week in August. Uh, they are responsible for coordinating the government's uh, response to uh, this Ebola situation. Uh, and the President is obviously very grateful for their service. As you've heard me say on a couple of previous occasions, the only way that we can entirely eliminate uh, the risk to the American people from the Ebola virus is to stop this outbreak at the source. Uh, and these men and women uh, who are government employees have been on the ground in West Africa uh, working to accomplish exactly that. So the President will be calling to offer his gratitude on behalf of the nation uh, for their work. Uh, upon completion of that call, uh, as the President walks from his office to uh, the helicopter, uh, the President will make a, a statement uh, about, about that call uh, prior to departure. So uh, you should plan on that accordingly. So with that, Nedra, would you like to get us started? Yeah, Josh, on that call, is that the President's way of basically showing appreciation at a time when maybe some of these workers could be subject to quarantine? Is he trying to send a different message? Uh, no, what the, the message that the President is trying to deliver is that they have a critically important role uh, in our response to uh, this Ebola situation. Uh, and simply put, their work is critical to ensuring that we entirely eliminate the risk associated with the, with the Ebola virus to the American people, and that's to stop this outbreak uh, at the source. And that work can only be done based on the skill and professionalism of uh, those who are serving on the ground. We've seen countries around the world make significant contributions to this effort, but no one's committed more than the United States of America. Uh, and the heart of this effort is this, uh, is this DART team that's operating on the ground with the support of CDC and other government agencies that are uh, responsible for responding to this effort. But uh, the President and, the, in fact, the entire nation is grateful for their service. Uh, and the President wanted to take a little time out of his day to uh, offer that gratitude. Uh, we heard Dr. Fauci say this morning that states are within their rights to impose um, stricter sanctions than what the CDC is recommending. But is there any concern that there is not a uniform policy and that that could be sowing confusion? Well, the thing that there should be no confusion about is the risk that is associated uh, with the Ebola virus in this country. Uh, the risk to the average American is vanishingly low, as Dr. Fauci himself has said. Uh, we know this because the science indicates uh, exactly how this virus is transmitted. Uh, it's not possible to get this virus by um, drinking food, uh, drinking water, or eating food in this country. It's not possible to get, contract the Ebola virus by breathing air in this country. In fact, we know that the only way that you can catch the Ebola virus uh, is to come in close contact with the bodily fluids of an individual that is already uh, exhibiting symptoms of Ebola. Uh, in fact, there are only two instances where the Ebola virus has been transmitted in this country. Uh, and that is um, uh, that that is an, a virus that is transmitted to two healthcare workers who were treating uh, a very sick Ebola patient. Uh, another good news that was announced earlier today: the second uh, of those two healthcare workers uh, is slated to be released from a hospital in Atlanta later today. So uh, there are only two instances where the virus was transmitted on American soil, uh, and both of those healthcare workers uh, who contracted the virus on American soil. Um, have been treated and, as of this afternoon, both will be virus-free and released from uh, treatment. So uh, that certainly is welcome news and, uh, and we're pleased to see it. The President had a meeting with administration officials here on Sunday for a couple hours, including Secretary Hagel. So how come the Pentagon then came out with a different policy for some of its, um, you know, troops who are in uh, West Africa? And isn't that the kind of thing that someone like Ron Klain should be coordinating within the government? Um, well, uh, Ron Klain uh, is responsible for coordinating our whole of government response to uh, the Ebola situation. Uh, he has performed very well in that task. Uh, the President and everyone here at the White House who uh, has a role in working on this effort is appreciative of uh, the kind of management expertise that he's bringing to this challenge and that the impact of his work uh, is already being felt both here at the White House but across the government. Um, uh, as it relates to this specific policy, I don't think it's a particular surprise to anybody uh, to anybody who um, understands that it's not uncommon for the uh, policy that's implemented for civilians 
to be different than a policy that's implemented for our military service personnel. Uh, that's not unusual. Um, and that, that, that takes a, a variety of forms. Uh, in this case, we're talking about a policy that's still under consideration, I might add, by the Secretary of Defense. So I don't want to suggest that any sort of – that I'm getting ahead of any sort of policy announcement that's made by the Department of Defense. But the policy that is evidently under consideration uh, is one that would restrict the movements of service personnel that had been working in West Africa. And the it, this illustrates the kind of different challenges that both that, – that our civilian governments are dealing with uh, and the challenge that our military is dealing with. Uh, when we're talking about our civilian governments – or our civilians – and what sort of policy is in place to monitor the health of health care workers who are returning from West Africa, we're talking about a couple of dozen of health care workers a week uh, who are returning to this country from West Africa. When we're talking about military personnel, we're talking about thousands of military service members who uh, have been or will be deployed to West Africa to carry out the mission that the President ordered. Uh, and uh, it, it simply will be easier to directly and actively monitor their health uh, if their movements are restricted to certain locations. We're talking about thousands of military personnel that are traveling from bases all across the globe. Uh, and uh, in order to monitor their health, it simply is easier to do that uh, if their movements are restricted um, and they're all co-located. Now, the other thing that is, uh, is important for us, I think, at this point to acknowledge uh, is that this is indicative of the kinds of sacrifices that our military service members make on a daily basis, that there are a wide range of sacrifices that our men and women in uniform make uh, for the sake of efficiency uh, and for the sake of uniformity and for the success uh, of our military. So for, to take a more pedestrian example than the medical one that we're talking about, uh, there might be some members of the military who think uh, that the haircut that's required uh, may not be their best, uh, but that's a haircut that they get uh, every couple of weeks uh, because it is uh, in the best interest of their unit uh, and it maintains unit cohesion, uh, and that is a policy of the military. Uh, and that obviously is a, uh, a situation in which um, application of military policy is not uh, or is uh, necessarily different than the application of uh, the policy in a civilian context. But we're not talking about haircuts. We're talking about, you know, the outbreak of a disease here that has of deadly implications. Of course we're not. And I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that it's uh, somehow unimportant. I think it is a useful illustration, though, uh, that the kinds of sacrifices that our men and women make in uniform uh, ra range from very simple elemental things like a haircut uh, to more serious things like uh, uh, medical quarantine. But the fact of the matter is those are the kinds of things that have an impact on their day-to-day -day, uh, personal convenience, uh, but yet they make those sacrifices for uh, the benefit of the broader military. But I guess my question is, is the White House concerned that a patchwork of different policies between states, the military, what the CDC is saying, is cre sowing confusion, or is that perfectly acceptable to have all these different standards from your viewpoint? Well, I, again, I, I don't think that actually reflects uh, the entirety of what's happening as well. I mean, there are, uh, there are a couple of states, New York and New Jersey, that have gotten a lot of attention in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but the fact is, if you look at uh, announcements that have been made by other states, states like Maryland, Virginia, Minnesota, Georgia, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, uh, all have is issued uh, policies that are much uh, closer to the kinds of uh, policies that were recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, and I do think that we're starting to see an emerging consensus from other states uh, about the policies that um, can be best implemented to protect their civilians. Okay. Uh, Steve? Gosh, the Australians have issued a blanket visa ban. Did, did you have any reaction to that? To how to uh, I've, I've seen those reports. Uh, I don't have an immediate reaction. Obviously, individual governments are going to make decisions about uh, what they believe is in the best interests of their uh, populations. The President has made his own uh, decision uh, about the wisdom of a travel ban. Uh, it is his view that implementing a travel ban would not be in the best interests of, of the safety and well-being of the American people. Uh, it would only serve as a disincentive for uh, people to be candid about their travel history. The reason we want people to be candid about their travel history is because if they've recently traveled in West Africa and had exposure to Ebola patients, then we want to make sure that they're properly screened before they enter the country. Uh, and even if they are not exhibiting symptoms of Ebola, we want to make sure that they have the information that they need uh, to uh, get uh, medical attention and treatment quickly 
uh, if uh, that should be necessary. You so, haven't raised any concerns with the Australians about this? Uh, I'd refer to the State Department for any sorts of uh, communications between uh, our government and theirs. But, you know, again, we, w we uh, certainly respect the right of, of, uh, of nations like Australia to make uh, their own decisions about what they believe is in the best interest of their citizens. We're a week out from the elections. How confident are you at this point that Democrats will retain the Senate? Uh, we continue to be confident because of the message that, uh, that the vast majority of Democratic Senate candidates are carrying about how important uh, it is for Congress to be advancing policies that benefit middle class families. Uh, that's in the best interest of the country. I think it also is a, uh, a value uh, that the vast majority of voters uh, agree on. Uh, there are others who are more steep in these details that would suggest that they have confidence uh, in the outcome because of the uh, advantage that Democrats have on the ground, uh, that many Democratic campaigns have been able to apply this, uh, uh, the lessons learned from the success of the Obama campaign in 2012 to benefit their own campaigns, uh, and that there are some early data to indicate uh, that those, uh, those, those strategies are, having, uh, are being successfully implemented this time around as well. Uh, but I'd refer you to, you know, my colleagues at the DNC and other places that may have a more granular assessment to, okay. assessment to share with you. And, and the President, uh, we're told, spoke to the uh, newly elected, newly re-elected Brazilian President. Did he invite her back to Washington? All the frictions about the surveillance practices, are they gone now, or is that some of that still there? Well, the President certainly was pleased to have the opportunity to uh, congratulate President Rousseff on her re-election. Uh, the President does value the strong working relationship that uh, he has had personally with President Rousseff, Rousseff but also uh, the strong working relationship that has existed between uh, Brazil and the United States for quite some time now. Uh, I don't have any announcements to make about uh, possible travel or, uh, or invitations that might be extended, but uh, we'll keep you posted. A, uh, a Brazilian state dinner would certainly be a sight to see, wouldn't it? <coughs> Mike? Um, just a couple clarifications on the military yes, question. Sir. So you had, you said, I think you said something about this is you're waiting to see whether it's a recommendation and you're waiting to see whether it's actually adopted. It, it's true, though, the Army actually implemented the policy yesterday, right? They announced it. Uh, I, the, the Army did make an announcement, but the, the Secretary of Defense is considering a department-wide policy. Department policy. Okay. And so I didn't want uh, to suggest in answering Nedra's question that, uh, that I was prejudging the outcome of any sort of decision that the Secretary of Defense uh, should rightly make. Okay. And then just, and then just to follow, I understand how the Army uh, and the broader Defense Department could, could well have policies that maybe make sense for them that don't make sense for the civilian population. But I think people looking at and hearing you guys talk about how these policies should be driven by the science, right? And by the and Dr. Fauci spent much of the morning today talking about how you associate the risk level with the level of of punishment or the level of restriction that you put on somebody based on the, the scientific risk level. And then you see the Defense Department saying that people who are coming back, soldiers who are coming back, who specifically are not medical providers, right? Like you guys have said that, you've said that from the podium a lot, like these people aren't That's actually dealing directly with the patients. So they're at least one step, if not multiple <coughs> steps removed from the healthcare workers who are actually, you know, suiting up and being with the patients. And, and that those people then are, you know, who are hammering the, building the, the hospitals are, are now being told to be isolated by the military. Do you guys view that as being driven by the same science that Dr. Fauci is talking about? Because it doesn't seem like that's being driven by that science. It may be driven by other elements, but it's not the science that you guys want, right? Well, let me, uh, let me say a couple of things about that. And I'm not sure if your question does this, but let me just put this on the table for broader discussion. It would be wrong to suggest that it would make the American people safer to apply this military policy in a civilian context. The science would not back up, back that up. Uh, in fact, uh, implementing this military policy in a civilian context would only have the effect of hindering our Ebola response by dissuading civilian doctors and nurses from traveling to West Africa to stop the outbreak in its tracks. Uh, and you've also heard me say many times that the only way that we can entirely eliminate the Ebola risk to the American people is to stop this outbreak in its tracks in West Africa. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, and in some ways this goes back to uh, the numbers. What Dr. Frieden discussed yesterday in talking about the kinds of measures that should be in place to monitor the health of healthcare workers who are returning from West Africa. Uh, is that they will conduct, essentially, a personalized assessment uh, of each traveler as they're returning. 
that is uh, something that is possible to do because there are only a couple dozen a week who are returning from West Africa to the United States. Uh, and that is slimmed down even further that these individuals are spread across five different airports. So it's possible to conduct a, a personalized assessment, uh, both of the risk that each individual faced when they were in West Africa uh, and how that risk uh, should impact the kinds of the kind of monitoring that this individual receives. And that's the way that this policy is implemented in a civilian context, because the, 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 the science tells us uh, that the only way that you can uh, transmit the Ebola virus uh, is when you're exhibiting symptoms and somebody comes into close contact with the bodily fluids that you excrete while you're exhibiting those symptoms. Um, so that's why we're focused on uh, the health and whether or not someone is exhibiting symptoms. Uh, it's much more difficult, I think, for obvious reasons, to conduct a personalized assessment uh, of risk and tailor a monitoring regime for them uh, when you're talking about thousands of people who performed a wide variety of functions in a wide variety of locations in this region of the world uh, and when they're preparing to travel back to a wide range of localities, not just around the United States, but around the globe. Right? These are the men and women who are being deployed to West Africa uh, are coming from uh, military installations around, around the world. And so for the sake of, of, uh, of efficiency, uh, there's an obvious benefit to restricting the movements of these individuals so that their health can be monitored consistent with scientific guidelines. Uh, and so the last thing I'll say about your question, Mike, and I think in some ways this might get to the core of it here, that what we're talking about is the implementation of a policy that is consistent with the science, right? That we are uh, both uh, military leaders and civilian leaders acknowledge that after tr spending time in West Africa, the health of these individuals should be monitored. And uh, in the military context, the way that this uh, monitoring recommendation uh, is applied uh, is by closely restricting the movements of our military personnel so that that monitoring can be done. I think we would all acknowledge that that is going to make, uh, that that's going to make personal life for some service members a little inconvenient. But what we know about, about our men and women in uniform is one, that they're willing to make sacrifices for the sake of the broader efficiency of the military. We also know that they're, um, there are other ways in which their basic life will not be as disrupted as the civilians would. For example, our military personnel, while their movements are restricted, would continue to receive a paycheck. Uh, that's something that, in a, in, when applied in a civilian context, may not be possible. The last thing is, um, and this sort of goes to something that somebody raised yesterday, when we're talking about uh, medical professionals who are going to West Africa, <coughs> these are individuals who are volunteering to do so. Uh, that is why their service and uh, commitment to serving their fellow man is worthy of, of uh, a lot of praise and respect. Um, when we're talking about military members, these are individuals who've signed up for the military uh, and they're ordered to travel to West Africa. Uh, so the notion that we may impose an undue burden um, or at least uh, impose some inconvenience on them uh, doesn't affect their ability to, to fulfill the mission. Uh, despite the inconvenience, we know that they're going to go serve their country because they're ordered to do so by their commander in chief. Uh, the calculation for a civilian is different. Uh, these are individuals who have responsibilities uh, that, um, that we wouldn't want to, well, let me say it this way. These are individuals who we wouldn't want to unduly burden uh, because we're asking them to volunteer uh, their uh, expertise, and e expertise and knowledge to stop this outbreak at the source. Okay. Uh, Richard. Thank you, Josh. Um, Ambassador Power has been uh, requesting a, a wider, larger involvement of different countries in the fight of, uh, against the Ebola virus in West Africa. Um, the Secretary Kerry is in Canada today. Uh, is it the kind of, uh, is, is he going to bring this request to the Canadian government? Is this the kind of, uh, of uh, work he's going to do over there? And, and also I'd like to know if the President himself is involved in reaching to other leaders and saying and asking for more people on the ground. Yeah. Uh, Richard, the President has made a number of phone calls over the last couple of weeks to world leaders to urge them to make a greater commitment to the international Ebola response in West Africa. Again, the only way that we can entirely eliminate risk from the Ebola virus to the American people uh, is to stop this outbreak at the source. And it's going to require the international community 
marshaling sufficient resources and personnel uh, and equipment, focusing it on this region of the world uh, and stopping this outbreak. And the President committed Department of Defense resources to lend their logistical expertise to make the flow of equipment, uh, supplies and personnel into that region of the world more efficient. Uh, and we have seen that that has galvanized the international community to respond more robustly to this urgent need. Um, and the President has had a number of conversations with world leaders to encourage them to ramp up their commitment. Uh, we can get you, we can follow up with you to get you some more specifics about who the President has called uh, and what sort of commitments have resulted from those conversations that the President has convened. Okay? Um, John. Josh, uh, Chris Christie uh, said this morning uh, about the CDC, they don't want to admit it that we're right and they were wrong. I'm sorry about that. So th th there seems to be still quite a disagreement of uh, how things are, are playing out. I'm, I'm just wondering. There certainly wasn't a disagreement about the need for Nurse Hickox to be released. Yeah, well, uh, she was released consistent with the guidance from the CDC, uh, and she is uh, uh, making her way, probably, presumably has arrived uh, in her home in Maine, uh, again, consistent with the guidelines that were articulated by the CDC. Has the President gotten around to talking to Governor Christie yet? Uh, again, we had a, a number of, I don't remember if you were here yesterday, we had a number oh, of, uh, yeah. okay. So I you, maybe, I maybe you may remember as vividly as I do that uh, I'm, not, I'm just not going to get into uh, a detailed accounting of the conversations that have taken place between uh, he sure members of the, the administration. He the impression that he hasn't had a chance to talk to the President. It seems kind of strange that this is the governor of one of the states in one of the five airports uh, uh, that, uh, that you've cited, uh, putting these extra procedures in place, um, wouldn't some coordination be, be appropriate? I mean, it seems yeah. like if, if, if they I had did. spoken, I imagine you would have told us. So, I mean, how is it that he hasn't gotten around to? Yeah, to I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't assume that uh, there. Are, uh, well, in the interest of transparency, you would tell us if they had <laughs> yeah. spoken. I, mean, I that's, assume that's a good one. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, what I can tell you is that there are uh, administration officials from a wide variety of agencies have been in very close touch. Uh, with New Jersey officials for exactly the reasons that you're citing. That New Jersey is one of the locations uh, where uh, travelers from West Africa uh, are arriving in the United States via uh, commercial air travel. Uh, and there is in place uh, in, uh, at Newark Airport a monitoring regime uh, or a screening regime that uh, is supervised by the CDC, that is carried out by CBP officers. Uh, and there has been close coordination between uh, those individuals who are conducting that screening uh, and public health officials in New Jersey who have worked to ensure uh, that healthcare workers have the supplies and training necessary to take in any Ebola patients if they're caught in that screening. So uh, that is one indication of the level of coordination that's already underway. I already cited the other example, which is uh, that, uh, that uh, Casey Hickox, the nurse who had recently traveled to West Africa, uh, has been released consistent with uh, the scientific advice that had been offered by the CDC. So I think there are a couple of uh, a couple of ways that we can illustrate the kind of coordination that we would expect at the state level between the federal government uh, and New Jersey officials. I'd also point out, uh, again, states like Maryland, Virginia, Minnesota, Georgia, Connecticut, the District of Columbia uh, are all places that have, have also issued guidelines uh, that are much, that hew much closer to the scientific guidance uh, from the CDC uh, and is indicative of the kind of coordination that exists between the federal government uh, and in all 50 states. Now, yesterday, you had, uh, when asked about the defense, uh, about the, the Army policy, um, you said that this was made by one commanding officer in the Department of Defense. Can you tell us who that commanding officer was? Well, I, at, at the conclusion of our, uh, at the conclusion of the briefing yesterday, or I guess maybe it was even in the early evening, uh, General Odierno uh, made, a, made this announcement about Army policy. So uh, that's the that is the that is the policy that's currently. That, that's not just Army. one commanding officer. I mean, that's that's the chief of staff of the United States Army. Uh, that's correct. And and the and Army that was an, again, that was an announcement that was made after the after the briefing that we had yesterday. But wasn't he the one commanding officer you're referring to? No, I was not, because that announcement had not been made in the context of yesterday's briefing. And and the Army uh, represents the overwhelming majority of those that will, that are serving right now in West Africa. It's not clear to me exactly what the breakdown is, but there are... The Department of Defense tells me of the 4,000 that will eventually be in place, 3,200 at least will be Army. So this is effectively, I mean, you say there's, there's no Department of Defense uh, policy yet, but I mean, the, the Army represents the, the, the bulk of those here, and, and the bulk of those will be subject to this policy that I'm, General Odierno has announced. Uh, I'm confident that even General Odierno uh, would, in, would, uh, would defer to the rightful role of the Secretary of Defense in setting department-wide policy. 
uh, when it comes to measures Secretary like this. Secretary of Defense will reverse the Army on this? Do you think that's uh, a I'm possibility? Not gonna, I'm not going to prejudge the outcome of a decision that's made by the Secretary of Defense. Okay, and then I just have one other uh, a question. Uh, as I'm sure you saw the ABC News Washington Post poll. Um, I don't think I had a chance to catch um, it this morning, John. Um, <laughs> Maybe you can fill me in, though. I will. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in our poll, and this is something we've seen in several other polls over the last several months, um, uh, sixty percent said they have little or no trust in the federal government to do what's right, and sixty-three percent believe that the government's ability to deal with problems has actually gotten worse over the last few years. What, what, what do you make of this? I mean, obviously, President Obama, somebody who came into office uh, intent on restoring the public's faith, the ability of government to uh, make the, uh, make their lives better, mm -hmm. uh, to see this where you have mm -hmm. such a high percentage. Uh, of the American public saying they have little or no faith in the federal government? Well, I, um, I, I can't account for the, the answers that presumably were, uh, were given by you know, several hundred uh, Americans. What I can say is uh, that this administration has placed a priority uh, on ensuring that the United States, as it has long been, continues to be uh, a force for good in the world. Uh, and whether that is uh, responding to a situation like an Ebola outbreak in West Africa that nobody else wants to have to deal with, uh, that the United States of America is the one nation that's willing to stand up and make a significant commitment uh, in a way that actually galvanizes a response uh, from countries and organizations around the world. Uh, that it's the United States that the world turns to uh, when the President says we need to build an international coalition uh, to take the fight to uh, a terrible uh, extremist organization like ISIL that threatens to destabilize an entire region of the world. And so it's the United States and under the, this President's leadership that a coalition, coalition of more than 60 nations uh, has been built uh, to take this fight to ISIL. Uh, here at home, uh, you know, you've seen a, a pretty aggressive response uh, from this president in the early days of his administration when we are on the precipice of a second Great Depression, uh, that because of the policies that this administration put in place uh, supporting uh, our men and uh, our workers, uh, our innovators and our entrepreneurs who eventually led us back from, uh, from the depths of that uh, economic downturn uh, in a way that has surprised um, a lot of observers, uh, even some of our observers in-house, that the resilience of the American economy uh, continues to grow at a, at, a, at a rate that has surprised many experts. Uh, and you've heard the President himself say that the United States of America uh, has created more jobs uh, since that economic downturn uh, than uh, Europe, Japan, and other large economies combined. So uh, this, I think, is indicative of the important role the United States has to play, both in terms of a confronting problems on a global scale, but also making sure that the needs of middle class families here at home are met as well. Uh, and I recognize that there is plenty of skepticism about that, and um, I think that is uh, indicative of your poll. But I also think that a close examination uh, of this President's record uh, indicates uh, that people can feel very good uh, about the United States government, particularly in the leadership of this President, uh, being a force for good in the world. Why do you think there's such skepticism on that? I don't know. You're, the, the, you're, the pollsters that you paid good money to conduct that poll probably would have better insight than I would on that. So. Jim. Josh. Uh, getting back to Ron Klain, you said earlier that uh, he's performed very well in his task mm -hmm. so far. What has he done? Mm -hmm. Well, there are, um, I, I guess there are a couple of ways to answer that question. Uh, you know, the first is, you know, Ron is somebody who, since Wednesday, so I guess we're talking about uh, his seventh day on the job. He, did, he certainly didn't get the chance to take the weekend off, I'll tell you that. Um, that's somebody that since Wednesday uh, has been very hard at work uh, in coordinating the whole of government uh, approach that the President has mandated for responding to the Ebola situation. Uh, and that means that uh, Ron has arrived here at the White House early in the morning. Uh, he stayed till late at night. Uh, he's convened a variety of meetings with senior officials here at the White House. He's regularly briefed the President. Uh, I know that last week he had the opportunity to travel to uh, the Department of Health and Human Services to meet with officials there who are, uh, who've been working so hard uh, on this response. Uh, you all know that later this week uh, Ron will be traveling to Atlanta where he'll be meeting with officials at the CDC. What date uh, uh, I don't have an actual date on that. I know that it's later this week. We'll see if we can get you some more details on that. Um, but, you know, I can tell you that the, um, you know, that this is the, uh, you know, that this is the, the result of a lot of work here. And, um, you know, we continue to um, be pleased that uh, we're putting in place the policies that are driven by science, 
that are motivated to protect the American public uh, and uh, are geared toward stopping this outbreak at the source. Ultimately, that's the only way that we can entirely eliminate the risk from this disease. And his lack of visibility could be a problem. <coughs> the New York Daily News has on its front page, where in the hell is, or where in the hell, are you, czar, czar you, or something like that. It's, it's, yeah. There's a play on words with czar and, and so forth. Really clever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but, yeah. uh, but I suppose there could be a public perception out there that he's kind of invisible, and if he's, if he's doing so much, why not? Let everybody see it. Well, um, I guess I'd say a couple things about that. The first is, yeah, I recognize that all of you have not had a chance uh, to see him and talk to him every day, but the president certainly has. Uh, and the president is appreciative of his uh, commitment to this very difficult task. Uh, and I think the American people uh, are, uh, you know, are in a position where they can be confident that somebody that has extensive management credentials, both inside and outside of government, uh, somebody that has uh, excellent organizational skills and somebody that has a reputation uh, for getting results uh, is somebody that is uh, on the task and is responsible for uh, coordinating uh, this very challenging problem. And uh, getting, uh, uh, there's a chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, Bob Goodlatte, has sent a letter to uh, Secretary Johnson and Secretary Kerry asking whether or not there are plans to admit Ebola-infected non-citizens in the U.S. for treatment. Is there any, any kind of response to that? Is that happening? Uh, I haven't seen the letter. We'll have to take the question. Do you know, so, you don't know whether or not that's happening or not? To, uh, I haven't, again, not I have With non-citizens be coming into the U.S. Uh, that, for that certainly hasn't happened so far. Uh, I don't know of any plans to do that, but again, we'll take a look at the letter. And uh, It sounds like he sent the letter to DHS and the State Department, so you might uh, see if they have a response to this letter. And, and on the midterms, are you guys disappointed in any way that this is, that this Ebola scare has occurred right before the midterms. So that it, it, it's just sort of come at an inopportune time. It's thrown this White House off message somewhat. You haven't been able to talk about the things you wanted to talk about. Um, is, that, is that a problem, do you think? Well, I, I guess I would uh, first pause that I don't think there's ever a good time for an Ebola outbreak. Um, so uh, that said, I, um, that said, uh, you know, I think that the, this is the kind of challenge uh, that the American people anticipate that their uh, government should take on. Uh, and I didn't get a chance to review the ABC Washington Post poll today, unfortunately, but I did have the benefit of checking out the CNN poll. It sounds like John did too. Uh, according to the CNN poll, uh, maybe this is your next question, uh, a substantial majority of Americans do have confidence in the federal government's response to the Ebola situation. Yeah. So, That's a substantial majority? Uh, yeah, and I think there is, well, I, what I was trying to say is that there's an even larger percentage, I think it's like 74 percent, I do not believe that there will be a widespread outbreak uh, in the United States. So, uh, what, what does I think that say to you? What does that say to you? What does what say to me? The, the fact that there are so many Americans, a large majority of Americans, who don't think uh, that there will be a, a widespread Ebola outbreak. Uh, it, it, it's an indication to me that a, uh, at least a large percentage of Americans uh, are focused on listening to the science uh, and do understand what our scientific experts tell us, uh, which is that the risk the likelihood of, an, of a widespread outbreak of Ebola inside the United States uh, is exceedingly low. Uh, and that's attributable to a wide variety of things. Largely, that's attributable to the way that this disease is transmitted. Uh, some of that is attributable to the modern medical infrastructure that's in place in this country to treat Ebola patients in a way that, uh, re uh, that doesn't pose a significant risk to the broader community. Uh, it's also attributable to uh, the uh, whole of government approach that the President has employed uh, in responding to uh, this particular situation and making sure that there are guidelines in place uh, for uh, monitoring the health of individuals who have recently traveled uh, in West Africa but have returned to the United States, uh, making sure that there are guidelines in place that, uh, so that healthcare workers can treat Ebola patients in a way that doesn't uh, expose themselves or the broader community uh, to greater risk. Uh, it's also, uh, uh, it also benefits from uh, the substantial commitment of uh, federal resources to try and stop this outbreak at the source. Again, that's the only way that we uh, entirely eliminate uh, the risk from Ebola to the American people. So uh, I think there are a, a large number of reasons that people can feel confident uh, that that's the case. And I'm, I was pleased to see in your poll that uh, about three yes, out of four Americans do. We put it out. There you go. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Bob, what you got? Um, let me try to ask the question of the last two days in a broader sense. Okay. The, uh, that usually works. <laughs> um, the Ebola 
Should we note the sarcasm in the briefing? This is lost anybody. <laughs> Future, yeah. Future yeah. individuals may not benefit from the uh, the look on my face when they're did answering this. I'm sorry, Bob. Did Go New ahead. Jersey officials from Governor Christie on down? Yes, sir. <clears throat> relent over the nurse who wouldn't quarantine quietly, so to speak, um, because of discussions with the administration officials from the president on down. Do you think that's why they ended up sending her, letting her go? Or was it the threat of a federal lawsuit? Were those discussions that, of that nature? Yeah, that's a good question. I think you should ask Governor Christie why he made the decision to allow her uh, to leave. Uh, that decision that he made is certainly consistent with the, it's consistent <laughs> with, well, the decision that he made, I, I didn't mean to suggest that you weren't doing your job. I just, no, no. I'm just suggesting that he's here. in a better place to answer it. Yeah. I think I would just observe that the decision that he made is entirely consistent with the advice that he'd received from the CDC. Uh, and I do think that is indicative, to his credit, uh, that is indicative of the strong coordination uh, and communication that exists between his office and the Centers for Disease Control. And uh, he made that decision consistent with the scientific advice uh, and our, the scientific expertise that's been amassed in the four decades since uh, we've been dealing with Ebola outbreaks in West Africa. Uh, and um, we, we, want, we want our public officials to be in a position where uh, their policy decisions are being driven by the science, and so he deserves credit for that. April. Josh, um, has this administration been working with some of the other countries who are invested in Africa? And what are the conversations, if you've had them, about giving and supporting and trying to contain and prevent this Ebola outbreak? And I'm talking about countries specifically like China, um, who's very much invested in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and they have been working on building infrastructure. What is the conversation with this administration and the Chinese <coughs> government in reference to trying to help fight and combat people out there? Well, I, I don't have any specific conversations to read out to you. I'll check with uh, my colleagues at the NSC and see if they can provide you some additional uh, detail about those conversations. Uh, I think the one thing I'll say is that uh, as indicated by the significant commitment that this administration uh, has made to responding to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, no one is more invested in Africa's success than the United States of America. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a colorful colloquial expression about uh, when times get tough that you know who your friends are. Uh, and I think it's apparent that the people in, uh, at least in these three West African countries, uh, are facing a really tough time now. Uh, and I think they can take uh, a lot of solace in knowing uh, that the most powerful country in the world is uh, their friend and is ready to back it up with the kind of concrete action that will be necessary to stop this outbreak in its tracks. Okay, um, I follow on that, but right now, you know, China is considered by the IMF the greatest economy in the world. So with that... I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. The greatest economy in the world? I quibble with that notion. Read it, read it, read it. Well, they're not the greatest economy. They, they're the biggest economy, the best, the biggest economy in the world right now. The IMF, go read the paper. It was last week, a couple weeks ago. So anyway. Okay. Um, we don't have to argue about this. I'm not. Go ahead I don't with your like question. being discredited. But um, moving on. Well, um, okay. go ahead. That's right. Let's move on. I'll take your advice. So anyway, um, with them having this economy, this great world economy now, uh, being considered number one. Don't they have, isn't there I'm not going to concede that point, so can you just okay, ask well, the question in a way that doesn't uh, say something that I'm not willing to All right, well, let's, to. okay, let's say this then. By China being the economy that they are around the world and how they invest in Africa, do they have a responsibility? I see what your question is. Um, I think the simple answer to your question is yes. I think every major uh, economy uh, and country in the world, regardless of the size of their economy, uh, has a responsibility uh, to join the international effort to stop this outbreak at the source. Uh, the President has, has identified this Ebola outbreak as a national security priority. Uh, that means it's also a national security priority for other countries uh, around the globe. Uh, and we certainly would welcome uh, the, the commitment of resources from uh, countries around the world, including China, to this broader effort. I know that there has been a commitment of resources from China. I don't know. I, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't detail it for you. But we can look up some uh, additional information for you if you'd like. Uh, but we certainly would welcome a greater commitment uh, from nations like China. And the President has had a number of conversations with world leaders in the last couple of weeks uh, about, uh, about those countries 
uh, making a more substantial commitment to this broader effort. Uh, but as it relates specifically to China, I just don't know exactly what kinds of conversations have been held and what sort of commitments that they've made. Uh, but I think as a general principle, I can say that nations like China uh, should commit additional uh, resources to this international effort. And last, the last question: Have you heard of any? Uh, have you heard any word from the economic uh, persons who are dealing with the economies in those West African countries to talk about the economic impact <coughs> on their countries since um, August? Since the Ebola outbreak really started. Well, this is uh, one of the reasons that the President uh, is concerned. Uh, this is one of the things that led the President to uh, say that this, that this Ebola outbreak is a national security priority, because it's having a very destabilizing impact uh, on the region. As it spreads, that impact could become more significant. Uh, it also clearly has a significant economic impact. Uh, that there are uh, So that is something that the President is concerned about. Uh, he's concerned about the impact that could have on uh, the local population uh, and on the population of neighboring countries. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the details of the financial toll, uh, I'd refer you to the State Department that is likely to have conducted an analysis like that. Uh, but the, I think as a general matter, I can tell you that the administration is concerned about the negative economic impact uh, of this Ebola outbreak in those three countries. Major. Uh, listening to your uh, answers to Mike, it seems to be worth surmising that the reason the Army Chief of Staff issued the order he did is not for public health reasons or scientific reasons, but for reasons of order and efficiency. Is that a fair interpretation? Well, uh, I guess you should ask them exactly why they put in but place that policy. The an answer explain but, the differentiation but, between civilian interactions and military protocols and <coughs> the fact that they get paid, the fact that they take orders, mm -hmm. the fact that there is a efficiency component you believe would be complicated by them returning to base wherever it is. Yeah. So I'm, I, I say that all those things is a factual matter, that these are sort of clear factual differences uh, in terms of the consequences of, uh, of implementing this policy in a military context and implementing this policy in a civilian context. But in terms of what actually motivated him to make no, this no. decision. You said there was not a scientific reason to do it and that it would actually, if implemented in the civilian world, would be harmful. So I'm just saying that's true, and so that's an explanation about why we've so implemented. Doesn't back it up in the public health. Doesn't back it up. Other reasons back it up as a policy. No. I, again, what I'm what I'm trying to say is to suggest that a, applying the military policy in a civilian context would make the American people safer is just wrong. the The science doesn't back that up. So uh, we should acknowledge the different circumstances that exist in a military population uh, and a civilian population. Uh, in this military population, there are, uh, first of all, this military population that spent time in West Africa is much larger in scope and in scale than right. the civilian. But you would acknowledge that it could create confusion in the public mind to hear that members of the military who are not directly providing medical care but are building structures and providing the airlift and all the other capabilities are going to have isolated treatment for 21 days, or isol being isolated for 21 days, whereas a healthcare worker who, as she said in her own blog, held a dying child who died from Ebola in her arms, is not subject to the same level of direct, active, isolated monitoring. They would wonder, well, wait a minute, what? Well, these seem to be in different risk categories, and yet the military is taking this much broader, extensive precaution an isolation approach, while as in the civilian world, we aren't. Right. You can understand how people might be confused about that. Well, I can understand why people might suggest that there's a benefit to applying a military context, military policy uh, that works in a military context and suggesting that it might work in a civilian context. And I'm just saying that's wrong. The science doesn't back that up. Uh, General Odierno and eventually Secretary Hagel will have to discuss why they, why they made the decision to implement this policy in a military context. I think as a factual matter, we can, uh, we can observe that this military population is substantially larger uh, when compared to the population of healthcare workers that are returning to this country from West Africa. Uh, because the population that's returning from West Africa is uh, the population of healthcare workers that's returning from West Africa to this country is smaller, uh, it's more feasible to actually conduct a personalized risk assessment and tailor the kind of monitoring regime that should be in place to ensure that they and the people they come into contact with are safe. And that's exactly what is happening. Uh, and that is why 
uh, the, the risk that is facing the average American, uh, even if they were to come into contact uh, with somebody like Nurse Hickox, uh, is low. And um, that is why uh, our uh, monitoring regime is tailored the way that it is, so that the only way that that risk starts to rise is if she starts to exhibit symptoms uh, of Ebola. Uh, and again, that goes to the way in which the Ebola virus is transmitted. Uh, so again, we have, that's why we have protocols in place to monitor the health of healthcare workers when they return to the United States to do so closely uh, and to quickly uh, isolate and treat them uh, if there is a concern that they might be exhibiting uh, s uh, symptoms of Ebola. Uh, those kinds of risk assessments for a population that large uh, is simply not feasible. Uh, and that is, um, that's just a fact based on the size of the, the military population that we're talking about. Uh, and so uh, there is uh, obviously an efficiency gain that's associated with uh, restricting the movements of those individuals uh, and carefully and directly monitoring their health. Can I just, David, can I just follow up real quick on these reports? So, so you've said now a couple times it's impossible or it would be very difficult for the military to follow up and do the personalized assessment on these people that you can do because of the numbers, the vast numbers. Mm -hmm. But isn't it also true that the, the military has far more knowledge about these people, about the people in the military, than you do some random doctor appearing at, a, at a, an airport? You have complete medical history on file for these people. You know who they are, where they are, how to get in touch with them. They go back to base. They go back to military. To, and, and you said there's all these bases, right? So even if there's 4,000 people, if you take the maximum that are there, they're going back to dozens of bases. So you divide 4,000 divided by dozens, you might only have a, you know, a few dozen at each base. I mean, yeah. how, why is it so difficult to imagine that you could apply the same CDC-based, medical-based standards that you're doing in civilian at the military level? I don't understand. Uh, I, I think, I, again, I think it's the Department of Defense. It's officially, it's essentially the Department of Defense that will render a, a verdict on this, right? But I think what is uh, beyond, what is beyond question, uh, is that it can be more efficiently done. Uh, if the movements of these individuals are restricted and they're limited to one area. Uh, and um, as I originally posed the question to you, is well, the overriding reason to do this? Uh, I, I think it is obvious that it is more efficient to do it this way. What is motivating this decision is something that will have to be explained to you by the people who are making this decision. I'm not going to write, this is a decision that the, the Secretary of Defense is still considering and when he makes an announcement he'll have a rationale for why he believes this policy makes sense in a military context. The uh, officials at CDC and HHS and governors in states across the country are responsible for figuring out what policy should be applied in a civilian context. Uh, and for that I can uh, answer the motivation about these policies. Uh, and in this case, it is wrong to suggest that applying the military policy would in any way make our civilian population uh, more safe it were, if it were implemented in the civilian context. The day that Ron Klain was named, I asked you a hypothetical question and you took it and gave it an alternate answer. I said, well, would Ron Klain be someone who, if a school district shuttered its doors in an abundance of caution and the White House thought that was a bad idea, would he call? You said, no, he would probably get in touch with the relevant cabinet agency and they would call. Since you opened the door to that hypothetical and now we have a real situation, can you, in the name of transparency and explain to the country how Ron Klain's impact is being felt across the government, tell us that when New York and New Jersey adopted this policy that clearly the CDC thought was either questionable or perhaps rash, that Klain told Secretary Burwell, get in touch with the New Jersey health authorities and resolve this situation in a way that is closer to the CDC guidelines that are about to be released. That seems like a completely logical implementation felt across the government process. Can you tell us that's what happened? Uh, I can tell you that officials at CDC and HHS and even here at the White House have been in regular touch with officials in New York and New Jersey. Uh, and that's, that was true uh, before Ron Klain got you here. Cut this Gordian knot. What is it's he doing? Well, I, again, I tried to describe that earlier to, to Jim. So Bl again, blandly and, and but generically, what, I, what I'm not going to be in a position out. to do is detail all the conversations that have taken place between New, New York and New Jersey officials and officials in the administration, other than to say there have been a lot of them, and they continue. Wendell, when you were describing Mr. Klain's activities, did you mean to suggest he's briefing the president daily? 
Um, I meant to suggest that he's uh, briefing him regularly. He did have the, he did participate in the meeting that the President convened on Saturday, uh, I'm sorry, on Sunday. Uh, I don't know whether or not Ron uh, had the opportunity to visit with the President on Saturday. Uh, but so I guess he's been here for seven days and he's seen the President for six of them. I guess is the way that I would describe it. That I know of. Maybe he saw him on Saturday, too. Is he contributing to the PDB? Uh, I don't know how often the, this issue comes up uh, uh, in the PDB. But um, even if I did know, I probably wouldn't talk about the details of the PDB in here anyway. And if I could pick at a thread that, that you uh, declined to talk much about last week, the uh, union that represents uh, citizenship and immigration service adjudicators has also questioned the, this purchase of green card stock. Um, could that have been done without White House direction? Could that have been? I mean, look, I, you should check with DHS. I assume so. I don't understand why the White House would have to weigh in on uh, the purchase of uh, paper. but. There are I mean, lots of expenditure and a, a fairly substantial one, apparently. It's in the millions of dollars. Yeah. But again, I, I, I would be surprised, but I've been surprised before, uh, if the White House were involved in the purchasing of office supplies at uh, the agency level. There's been some suggestion that this was purchased by virtue of the fact that the Senate has passed a, a, an immigration yeah. reform bill. The House could follow suit. Mm -hmm. Is that feasible? You should check with the DHS uh, for any questions you have about. Uh, their purchase of office supplies and why they did, and when decided to make them. But the White House did not direct it. Well, I, again, Wendell, I would be surprised, as I mentioned earlier, I can take the question if you'd like, but I'd be surprised if the White House were in a position where we were having intimate discussions with agency officials about the office supplies that they're purchasing. It just seems unlikely. That's a no. The White House did not direct this okay. purchase. Justin. Um, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus today endorsed Tom Perez uh, for Attorney General. Um, I'm wondering both your reaction to that. I, I'm not yes. entirely optimistic, but also, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, but also I was wondering if the President's had any conversation with lawmakers as he was working through this decision process. Uh, I, I don't know that the President's consulted any members of Congress uh, about the decision that he lies ahead. Um, there's no doubt that uh, Secretary Perez has distinguished himself uh, as a particularly effective member of the President's Cabinet. Uh, he did a, did a tour at the Department of Justice prior to serving as the Secretary of Labor. Uh, he continues to do very good work there. Uh, but as it relates to uh, any sort of uh, personnel announcements uh, and the uh, Department of Justice, I don't have anything for you at this point. Last week, uh, White House officials confirmed that the President had spoken to Kathy Romler about the position uh, since that's a precedent that's been set. Can you say if he has spoken to Tom Perez about this? Um, I, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know if, it, if, if he's talked to him about it or not. And then on the, on the Rumler decision to withdraw her name, do you know if part of the reason that she decided to do so was the controversy that was sort of raised over the Washington Post report about uh, her handling of the investigation into whether a, a member of the, of the White House advance team or a volunteer on the White House advance team um, was involved in some way with the prostitute during the trip uh, to Columbia. Right, and the question is whether Did, w whether that was uh, an aspect of her decision or something that she or the president raised while they were discussing right. the job. Uh, again, I, I, I haven't talked to her about uh, the decision that she made in terms of her uh, announcement, but I'd be surprised if that contributed to it in any way. Okay. Jared. I wanted to follow up, uh, if I could, on my friend Bob's valiant attempt. Uh, in these conversations okay. that are going on, on the CDC guidelines, and I know that you said that they're following the science and that's what's leading these policies. Is there also guidance coming from the Justice Department about what steps are allowed to be taken when you try to quarantine somebody who's coming back? In other words, could the CDC try to make a recommendation and the Justice Department raise concerns that perhaps that's unconstitutional? I, I don't know that that instance has occurred. Uh, you could check with the Department of Defense about it. but. Most of these governors are making decisions, and I know that Governor Christie's in this category, that the decisions that he's making related to his state's quarantine laws or quarantine policies are related to state law, not federal law. I'm not talking about that. I, I know you don't want to talk about this situation in, in New Jersey. I get that. I okay. was just saying more broadly, like yesterday, we got additional guidance from the CDC, right? So they update it. They update it based on the best available science on conditions on the ground. Are there conversations happening with the Justice Department as these new guidelines are being discussed and implemented? Uh, not that I know of, but you should check with the CDC on that. 
And one other question I had. Um, why are these governor's races so important to the president? Yeah. Uh, that is a good question. The, uh, in many of these cases, we are finding that governors are playing a very important role in implementing federal law. Uh, and so whether it's raising the minimum wage uh, or uh, expanding Medicaid, um, that there are as an important role that governors are playing uh, in uh, you know, furthering the kinds of policies that the president advocates. Um, this, this also applies to voting rights uh, as well, that many governors do have uh, an important role to play in states uh, to uh, protect uh, the right of, uh, of eligible citizens to participate in elections. So uh, the, the, the stakes are high in these governor's races too, and I recognize that you know, this is the, uh, a subset of the Washington press corps, and so we're sort of focused on the federal races, but the outcomes of these statewide campaigns are significant as well and uh, are worthy of the president's attention. And, uh, in some cases, they do have significant consequences for the successful implementation uh, of policies that the president has worked very hard to pass. More so than the outcome of the Senate? Uh, I think it's different. Uh, obviously, the role of governors is quite different than the role of, uh, of individual senators. Uh, I, I, I think it's hard to assess sort of whether or not one is more important than the other. I think that they, uh, but they are significantly different. Thanks, John. So, uh, yeah, in the back, I'll give you the last one. Okay. Um, uh, okay, uh, yeah. It's a question of Mexico. Uh, is the president aware of the deepest uh, crisis on human rights that is taking place in Mexico in the last few weeks, That's the disappearance of 43 students in the state of Guerrero? And he does what he think about it. Uh, he shared the uh, idea that the, uh, this situation is slipping off the hands. It's going out of the hands of the president of Mexico. Uh, well, I, I have not talked to the president about this. I, I didn't, I'm not in a position to share any personal feelings that he may have. Uh, on this matter, but obviously uh, the reports uh, of this situation are um, are concerning. Uh, uh, but in terms of the role for the United States government in this situation, uh, I don't know of any, but I'd encourage you to check with the State Department who may be able to provide additional insight about any communications uh, that may have occurred between the United States uh, and the Peña Nieto administration uh, on this matter. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.